My name is Raphael Meshulam. I'm a professor at the Hebrew University. Uh, I've been there for many years. I've, I'm doing research on the chemistry and biology of natural products, mostly, but also of some drugs. There is no drug that ha doesn't have side effects. It just doesn't exist. Uh, the same is probably true for cannabis. Now, being a chemist, I was uh, particularly interested uh, in the individual constituents of the plant. Surprisingly, uh, the constituents of the cannabis plant uh, were not uh, well known when we started work many years ago, several decades ago. Uh, the, the active, the psychoactive component of cannabis was not known at that time, surprisingly again, because morphine had been isolated from opium uh, almost 150 years before that, and cocaine about 100 years before that, and yet the active component of cannabis had never been isolated in pure form. So uh, my colleague Oni and I went ahead doing that, and uh, uh, we published uh, uh, the, the compound, reported isolation of the active compound of cannabis, 1964, proved it, uh, elucidated its structure, and a little bit later also synthesized it, so it became available for uh, uh, research. Now, scientists like to work with a specified compound, not just with a mixture, because otherwise they, uh, n uh, it is very difficult to reproduce their results. And indeed, after 1964, there was a, uh, there was a lot of work on THC and some of the other constituents, which uh, we also isolated and uh, elucidated their structures. And for the next 20 years, there was a lot of work on these compounds, and much of the things that we know about uh, these compounds, the activity of these compounds, was done at that time. One thing was not known for 20 years, uh, uh, almost 20 years, and that was the mechanism of uh, THC action, surprisingly so. Uh, people thought that maybe it has some kind of a unspecified activity, acts on a membrane or something. Well, it turned out to be a mistake, actually. Uh, Alan Howlett, a um, uh, young uh, professor at that time of uh, uh, pharmacology at St. Louis, found that there is a uh, receptor, which was co later called CB1, and then a person in England uh, identified a second receptor known as CB2, mostly uh, in the periphery, but uh, then at some point it also pops up in the brain especially neurological diseases. So now we are sure of two receptors that are present and THC acts uh, on them and stimulates them and causes the activity when needed. Now, uh, receptors are not uh, present in the body because there is a plant outside there. They are present in the body in order to be activated uh, by something that our body produces uh, when and where needed. So uh, uh, we went ahead looking for the compounds in the brain and the periphery that uh, uh, would activate these receptors. And in 1992 and 1995, we uh, reported the most important ones. One of them we called the Nandamite. The Nanda comes from the Sanskrit name of uh, uh, Supreme Joy. And we were happy after working so hard uh, for identifying a compound, which has a uh, turned out to have a different chemical structure uh, from the compound in the plant. Rather strange, I would say, because the two compounds do the, exactly the same. And, there was, uh, and these compounds, which we identified in the brain and in the periphery, they're derivatives of uh, fatty acid. And these compounds uh, uh, are very important because the receptors are found in uh, large amounts, uh, high concentrations in the brain, in the periphery. These compounds are extremely important. They act in a huge number of physiological con conditions. They interact with other neurotransmitters. They interact with, uh, 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 in other systems as well. So they are uh, important players in our body. So there has been a huge amount of work on these two compounds, anandamide, another one we isolated, the 2-AG. And so today we know quite a lot about the mechanism and how they 
how they do and uh, therefore we can also learn a lot about uh, the ability of uh, plant cannabinoids like THC or synthetic cannabinoids that can act on this system, activate it or uh, uh, block it or change the metabolism of compounds and act on it. So uh, it is quite promising and chances are that we shall have drugs. We already have minor drugs, but I think that we shall have major drugs in the future that uh, act through this uh, particular system. My endocannabinoids, these are, this is the short name for endogenous cannabinoids. A cannabinoid is a compound which acts on um, two receptors. One receptor is found mainly in the brain, the other receptor is found mainly in the periphery. But surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, uh, during certain diseases, the second receptor, which is not present in the brain, starts to pop up. All of a sudden, it, uh, uh, it's available there. So the suggestion has, uh, was by us, by many others, that actually this receptor, which is not found in the brain, the CB2 receptor is a protective, uh, uh, is part of a protective mechanism. I mean, we have uh, protective systems in our body. The immune system is a protective system. It guards us against microbes and viruses, things like that. And if we didn't have an immune system, we'll be dead within a week, probably eaten up by microbes. Well, but we have the immune system and it guards us. But not everything, not all attacks on us are by... Uh, things like microbes or viruses, like pro uh, proteins. There are other things, breaking a bone or having a head uh, uh, smashed or something like that. I mean, these are major things. Well, actually, uh, the body has developed uh, protective systems of this type and indeed the endocannabinoids are part of this protective system acting through uh, the CB2 receptor probably also treat us through the CB1 receptor, but through the CB2 receptor, most definitely. And we have seen, for example, in brain trauma, that uh, uh, both the CB1 and the CB2 receptors start working over time, trying to reduce the damage that has been caused uh, by a head injury. Uh, we have seen, and I've submitted a paper now, that uh, Osteoporosis uh, is uh, reduced, the damage of osteoporosis, the actual osteoporosis itself is reduced by the endogenous cannabinoids. The endo endocannabinoid system seems to work. It's not the only one, but it seems to work there. And uh, not very surprisingly, we have found that additional compounds which actually don't bind to the cannabinoid receptors, but are very close chemically to these endogenous cannabinoids. These compounds, which we call endocannabinoid-like compounds, a strange word, but anyway, these compounds act on osteoporosis. We have uh, uh, animal mice that uh, uh, under certain conditions can develop osteoporosis, and we see that they are both uh, 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 well, uh, show osteoporotic features. We see that if we give these compounds, whether it is an endocannabinoid, like 2-AG, or whether it's those endocannabinoid-like compounds, uh, which we uh, found, they improve the situation, they improve the osteoporosis. Now, this is not so surprising. Uh, if, one, if one goes back and looks at what's going on, in the Mediterranean countries, for example, uh, there is less osteoporosis than in Northern Europe. And uh, according to some Greek statistics, if you like to read Greek statistics before you go to bed and sleep, according to Greek statistics, um, this is due to, ole to olive oil. And all the people are in the Mediterranean use olive oil. Now, olive oil contains oleic acid, and a compound which acts 
um, osteoporosis is a derivative of folic acid. It is an endocannabinoid-like compound. So this is what's happening with bones. Uh, we have a lot of other indications that uh, the action of the CB2 receptor is mainly a protective action. So we have uh, protective action in, in brain injury, we have protective action in bones, we have protective action in a lot of inflammatory conditions, and we have looked at rheumatoid arthritis, for example. It is a very powerful, these compounds are very powerful in certain uh, inflammatory conditions. Now an inflammatory condition um, in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it's an autoimmune disease. The immune system attacks the body itself. I mean the immune system is normally supposed to be there to attack uh, proteins that come from the outside, but sometimes uh, it uh, uh, doesn't know what it's doing and attacks our own proteins, our own body. Now we found that the endocannabinoid system protects and I was asked by our parliament, the parliament is called the Knesset, to head a committee to decide how to go ahead with cannabis both as a medicinal agent and so on and uh, there was a committee of uh, a, a government official mostly and I was the only one from outside so I was chairman and we wrote a big report and said that it should be utilized as a medicinal agent and the more research should be done and uh, also that uh, young people should not be sent to prison or convicted or uh, they should, files, criminal files should not be opened and so on uh, to, to make the thing more tolerable and so on. And although it was, the laws were never, it never became a law. Uh, the, a government official who was in charge of these things and would uh, apparently instructed the police to follow the, uh, these recommendations. So since then, to the best of my knowledge, uh, young people that were caught smoking pot were scalded and they told them, you, you, you have a lot of problems, but they never opened a criminal file, they never uh, went to, to, they never appeared in court, they never were sent to prison. The reason was, well, it makes sense. There are many aspects that one can talk about. One is the basic uh, biochemical, pharmacological, scientific uh, aspect of the whole problem. Here we have a new uh, neurotransmitter, a group of compounds that do a huge amount of, have a huge amount of tasks. If we look at related chemically related compound, I made a list of that, we, uh, these compounds are involved in almost all physiological reactions. There are uh, so many of them that I think that here there is uh, so much work to be done by uh, scientists over the next 20, 30, 40 years. A lot of those compounds are around. Some of them bind to the cannabinoid receptors, others are just uh, chemically related and bind to other receptors are involved in many, many other things. And as I mentioned before, those that bind to the CB2 receptors are part of a general protective uh, uh, facility, if you wish, in our body, like the immune system. So that's the basic thing. Then there is the medical thing. We have to find out wh what, uh, how we can use them and what are the diseases we can use these compounds against. And uh, there is a huge number of diseases that can be used again in certain amount, certain types of cancer, a lot of inflammatory diseases, um, head traumas, uh, things that I just spoke about, diabetes and so on. So there are many things that uh, can be improved. The bone, for example, uh, we just found, uh, we, I had the results last week, that uh, a bone that is broken, in animals in this case, a bone that is broken takes about 30% less time to, to heal if the animal is given a mixture of CBD and THC, which are essentially the major compounds in, in marijuana. 30%, that's a lot of, uh, 
that's a, 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 something that a lot of people can use. I mean, just mm -hmm. almost every young person breaks a bone at some point of his life. So, why not? Uh, osteoporosis, things like that. So I believe that in addition to the basic science, we shall learn, learn about uh, in medicine as, as therapeutic drugs. Uh, drug abuse, I don't think it's a major problem. Then, like every drug, one has to know as many details as possible. Can this drug, drug be used uh, in every case? Can it be used in pregnant women? Uh, normally, I would suggest no drugs to pregnant women if possible. I mean, as a male, I can uh, easily say that, let them suffer. <laughs> but uh, uh, the fact of life is that we do not know the long-term effects, effects which can appear many years later, not acute effects, many years later. This has happened before in some uh, hormone-type drugs that uh, the mother got the drug and then the the, uh, the children uh, had some problems. So I would strongly suggest that we should know more about the use of cannabis during pregnancy, but at the moment, no. Most definitely, cannabis, like any other drug, should not be used during pregnancy. These are two receptors that are specific for cannabinoids, yeah. but cannabinoids also, some of them bind to other receptors. There is one called 133, I think, GPR-133. Um, there is a, another one which is GPR-18. I may be mistaken on the numbers, but I think it's GPR-18, GPR-133, and so on. They are not specific for the cannabinoids, so there is a lot of discussion uh, between the pharmacologists. Should we call them in, um, cannabinoid receptors? The decision at the moment is, let's wait and see. At the moment, we have only two that have been approved uh, as cannabinoid receptors. All the others are with a question mark. Two receptors have been bought for certain specific conditions. Uh, but uh, uh, um, feeding, for example, appetite, feeding, things of that sort. Uh, uh, but some of the other actions most definitely uh, go through other systems. We do not know enough on where they are. There are a lot of compounds, endogenous compounds, mm -hmm. which do a huge number of things. For example, I'll be talking tomorrow about a compound which, is co which chemically is very closely related to an andamide, yet it does not bind to the receptor, but it, is a, uh, uh, it has quite a few other effects uh, it's a vasorelaxant, for example. That's important because uh, when one gets a uh, head injury, there are many things happening at the same time. One of them is vasoconstriction. These compounds, <coughs> or at least this compound, arachidonoyl uh, serin, this particular compound uh, is a vasorelaxant and it's produced by the brain. And chemically, it's very close to anandamide, yet it does not bind to the cannabinoid receptor. Mm -hmm. There are other things, for example, in, in the bone. We have uh, endogenous compounds like R2AG, which acts uh, and uh, lowers the damage of osteoporosis. It increases osteoblasts and reduces osteoclasts. Which receptor did that go through? Which receptor? CB2, but, well, mostly CB2. It acts on CB1 as well, but not directly, indirectly. But we also have an additional compound. For example, in the bone, we're speaking about bones, there is a compound, oleil serine, which is chemically related to, uh, to an antibiotic. And but it does not bind to the receptor, and yet it, it, it lowers uh, uh, the damage of osteoporosis.